Welcome to Lincoln School and to this very special evening. My name is Emily Dolbear and I'm the president of the Brookline Education Foundation. On behalf of the Brookline Education Foundation, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. We're so pleased to be supporting our fourth annual group of Margaret Metzger Fellows. fellows are in the room to stand to be acknowledged. That's pretty exciting. Uh, I'd also like to welcome, you don't have to stand, um, but I'd like to welcome Margaret's siblings and spouses who are all present here this, this year for the first time ever. Um, it's a really special moment. Margaret Metzger Fellowship honors a beloved educator and her mentorship of thousands of students and teachers. It also celebrates what's important about education, teachers and their craft, the lifelong pursuit of knowledge, and the magic that happens in classrooms every day, or most days. <laughs> Tonight we celebrate these six Brookline teachers from Heath, Coolidge Corner, and Pierce Schools and the high school as well as Margaret Metzger and her work. It is now my honor to introduce Donna Treese, Margaret's sister, who will speak about her. Good evening, I'm Donna Treese, Margaret Metzger's sister, obviously. Um, I want to thank, first of all, the Brookline Foundation for their continued support and providing such a lovely evening for all of us. This is, um, and I'm here especially to welcome this fourth class of Margaret Metzger Fellows. And this is a very special event that our family looks forward to every year. We look forward to this because here, at this time, listening to teachers, um, talk about their experience in the classroom. We know how much Margaret would love this event. She would be sitting at the edge of her seat in the front row, listening intensely, and I hope she would not be critiquing your essays, but I can't promise that. <laughs> Barbara, Margaret's widow, recently gave me many volumes of her journals. It's been interesting reading but I've only made it up to 1969 and she's not yet in Brookline. <laughs> when she was 16, she wrote in her 16-year-old voice, Mr. Mahan, our English teacher, told me I had the ability to write. I was very shocked, to say the least. The thought of a career in English had never occurred to me. I know I could never be a writer because I am not intelligent or outstanding, yet I'm flattered to the hilt. <laughs> it took her a long time to recognize her own worth. Luckily, Margaret did become an English teacher and became known as Metzger. She used to say she was the most fortunate person in the world. What would have happened if she had been born in an era when women couldn't teach? So along with parenting, it was her most noble endeavor. She claimed, claimed teacher, a title as her personal identity throughout her life. A life in the classroom was her dream. She loved working with teachers and later with, te excuse me, with teenagers and later with teachers. After having to leave uh, teaching due to her illness, she would call me every September to say how much she envied me. She hated to think the classes were starting without her. I tried to console her with the fact that she was still teaching an adult class of friends. Donna, you know that's not the same. I miss the energy of full class of adolescents. It's not at all the same. So it's very appropriate that we are here in September, the beginning of the school year, when all of your ideas, 
Your plans and goals are put into the laboratory of the classroom. Enjoy each day with your students. It's easy these days to say these are terrible times to be living in. But I think that Margaret would find these days the best of times for a teacher. May I quote from her article, To Teach or Not to Teach? Teaching poses questions worthy of a lifetime of thought. I want to think about what the great writers are saying. I want to think about how people learn. I want to think about the values we pass on to the next generation. I wish all of you teachers success this year. Teaching um, the values, uh, I hope that your teaching includes teaching something that is difficult, the value of kindness and generosity, and the value of speaking the truth. Remember your importance. Give that honest, genuine encouragement. Be present to your students. The students you teach don't stay in Brookline. They are like seeds that are being scattered around the world. The lessons you teach, the values you pass on, are what you give to the next generation and to all of us. And I believe I'm correctly channeling Margaret right now at this moment, who would be saying, Donna, shut up and sit down. I want to hear the essays on my favorite topic, the classroom. Good evening. My name is John Andrews, and I'm the coach for this class of writers and teachers. Um, I just want to, before we start, uh, thank with a big heart uh, the BEF, uh, Emily Dolbear, and others. Um, this couldn't happen without them. Um, and thank Donna and her family uh, for making this happen, too. This is uh, uh, one of my favorite parts of my job right now, is this work. So I, I deeply appreciate it. Um, at the high school, we used to have an event called Moonlighting, where teachers would stand up and sing and dance and perform a talent show, a faculty talent show. And Margaret would always say that she had nothing to bring to that talent show. Abby's nodding here, she's heard this story. And Margaret said that she would get up on stage and just grade papers, because that's all she knew how to do. But she knew how to do much more. She was a mentor, and she was a friend, and she was a teacher, and she was a gadfly. Um, and she was a writer, and she believed a couple things about writing. That writing was a process of discovery, that through writing we understand more deeply, we understand what we believe uh, through the act of writing. And that teachers need to share their stories. She was a published uh, author. Uh, many of us in grad school read her essays on how to be a, an English teacher. Um, so this, this project, uh, I think, is so in line with what she believed, the process of discovery, and the teachers need to share their stories. The first story we're going to hear tonight is from Isabella de la Torre, who's a Spanish teacher at the Coolidge Corner School. Uh, Coolidge Corner School. She is probably the newest to the profession of those of us up here, but I think you'll be inspired by her wisdom and her humor. Uh, Isabella. Twice I found myself in that situation. It was the end of the year celebration and our principal asked each of us to stand up for a student. Who had we helped? Who had we touched? Whose life had we changed? And again, I was at a loss. After, after three years of teaching Spanish, I had had over 800 students and I could not name one. Once more, I felt like a failure. There's this universal expectation that teachers change lives, that we all remember teachers from our childhood who became our role model, models and guiding stars. Well, I haven't been that teacher for anyone. The only student I could think of in, a moment, in that moment were the ones that made me wonder if teaching was really for me. <laughs> Students <laughs> like Andrew. He was the social type, you know, talkative, athletic, he had a swag. 
he would come in humming or singing, wearing these long basketball shorts and a jersey from a team that I did not know. Uh, on his way to his desk, he would always crack jokes or drop funny comments to several of his friends who were already seated. He was daring but sweet. He was not the popular type, but he was liked by most, if not all of his classmates. Sitting at my desk, I had on my dark pants, my button-down shirt, I was sweating in the non-AC, sun-filled room, pretending to be focused on my computer, but in reality observing it all from the corner of my eyes and compulsively looking at the clock, calculating in my head what was the best moment to stand up, close the door, and demand silence. It was the sixth or seventh time that I had been in that same situation with this group, and it felt just as hard as my very first encounter. I once had a little bit in common with Andrew. I was also talkative, athletic, I also had a bit of a swag, but not in my new role. As his Spanish teacher, I had become stiff, nervous, and serious. I had lost in just a few weeks my spontaneity, the joy that I used to do things with. Um, I felt robotic, and my days were just filled with anxiety. That day at 8 o'clock on the dot, I stood up, called for everyone's attention, partially in vain, and started my lesson. I continued talking over a few students who were chatting about their weekend plans, and we were now almost ready to start a turn and talk activity. Students were somewhat doing what I had asked them to do, and I was trying hard to remember what was the next item that I had on my lesson plan. Was it the video? No, 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 that's supposed to go after the worksheet and before the homework assignment. Uh, I think it was the vocabulary game now. Uh, in a circle on the floor. Oh, but wait, wait, did I, did I need a beanbag for this one? <laughs> or music, geez. Let me look at my, let me look that up quickly. The volume of the class started to raise. I run back to my computer and search for my lesson plan, which should have been printed, probably. Wrong folder, twice. Yes, yes, game, beanbag, beanbag. Class volume is noticeably higher now. I tried to quickly find the bean bag, and when I turned around, Andrew had decided that he could put his feet up on the table, lean back his chair, and check in with the friend who was sitting directly behind him. I could simply transport him to a pool party, and his body language would fit right in. <laughs> Unbelievable. When I turned around to face the scene, I could only make my classic seriously face, and he had put the, his feet down, banging the front legs of the chair on the floor. I knew my reaction was not appropriate. I should have said how unacceptable that was. Did he forget that he was in a classroom? It was my classroom. What was he thinking? Instead, I just called everyone to the rug and we played the vocabulary game. We moved on, but as always, I was feeling that I had no control over the situation. Andrew was not the only student that made me cringe before every class. Of the 300 students that I had my first year, I could name at least one Andrew in each one of the 15 groups that I taught. My first year as a teacher was the hardest year of my life, no joke. Nothing I did before was as hard as being a teacher, absolutely nothing. Teachers are on the stage all day. We feel judged and tested, challenged at every lesson by our administrators, by our peers, by our own students. It's a profession that takes you to task every day in a very real way. Did you plan well? What was the objective of your lesson? Did your students learn? How could it have been better? How can you make that one student engage? How can you challenge that one student a bit more? You ask yourself these questions after every single class. All the information just spins in your head, making you doubt every decision that you make. People just don't realize this. I certainly did until I became a teacher. During my first two, during my first two months, I went home crying and looked for jobs every single day. <laughs> I was in despair. I could not think or talk about anything else except how miserable I was. But at a dinner party, a friend of a friend who really did not meet, know me that well saw me in tears and gave me one suggestion that stood out among many others. Just write down one thing that worked well. It did not matter how simple it was, I just had to think of one. So I found one of these yellow pads and I slowly filled out two pages. Class ended on time. Uh, I, I remember to take attendance before 8.15. I didn't forget the puppets in the office. I had the worksheets ready when class finished the test early. 
students come to the days on the calendar together in Spanish. I had extra prep time because fourth graders had a field trip. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew asked me for help with math homework before class. Yes, he did. Can you imagine? I know he should have done the homework at home, but the fact that he had chosen me to talk that over with meant a lot. I read the problem, the problem twice because I really did not want to mess up the opportunity. <laughs> Imagine that I help him and we do the problem wrong. No, no, no. We didn't want that. So we talked through it and he told me how he thought that he could solve it. I read it again just to be sure. And uh, we agreed that he was in the right path. So he went off to his seat, finished up the problem, and the other students started to come in. And I started to be able to add more than just one thing to my list every day. And with time, each item was becoming slightly more meaningful. I got a smile back from my sixth grade student in the hallway. Students were excited about the video project and worked well independently. I successfully created a breakout video for my fourth graders. Got an email from kindergarten parents saying how much her daughter enjoys Spanish. Teacher said students kept saying pegamento to refer to glue in class. <laughs> the truth is that small math homework incident with Andrew had been a turning point. For sure, Andrew had no clue how important that had been for me. In fact, he left school two months before the end of the year and he didn't even say goodbye. But that didn't matter, not at all. I will never say that I touched Andrew's life in a meaningful way because I honestly do not think that I did. He touched mine though, and I became a teacher. I should say, as a, as a friend of mine was coming in, she said, I brought my Kleenex tonight. <laughs> Um, over the last four years, I've had a chance to work with 24 educators from around the Brookline system, and it has been a delight to work with K-12 teachers, special educators, librarians, uh, reading specialists, math specialists. I've learned so much from these teachers who, as Margaret would say, have self-doubt or a good capacity for self-doubt. That part of what makes a strong educator is asking the questions that Isabella was, was asking just before, um, constantly revisiting and rethinking. And I think that's a recurring theme you'll hear in the stories this evening. Our next story comes from my colleague, Sophie Corlin, who teaches English at the high school and is a BHS alum. Ladies and gentlemen, Sophie Corlin. Hi guys, can you hear me okay? All right, this is called Surrender to the Air. My first thought when I got the job was, I can finally become Miss H. The summer after I was hired to teach at Brookline, I imagined myself as my favorite high school teacher, Miss Hodling. I actually graduated from Brookline High, and Miss H was my junior year English teacher, or rather, our long-term sub. She was 23, the oldest of the four Hodling sisters. She had recently graduated from Harvard and wrote on the board things such as the French Philosophes and Diderot's Encyclopedia. She was refreshingly young after years of teachers who seemed to me, at least, to be my parents' age. She wore trendy outfits, she got excited in class, and once when we ran out of time during a particularly dynamic discussion, she threw a piece of chalk at the clock. <laughs> when I found out that I would be teaching Honors American Literature, the very course Miss H had taught, I envisioned the kids looking admiringly at me the way I had looked at Miss H. I imagined them hanging on my every word, spending an hour marking up T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland just to please me, finishing their junior paper a week early to get my feedback on their draft, stealing opportunities to pop by my desk for a chat. I would be the wise young woman they yearned to be like. You know where this is going. <laughs> my first year did not go that way. One section of juniors was not particularly eager to impress their English teacher. One girl decided to write her introductory letter to me about how much she hated reading. And the other group spoke effusively about how much they liked English classes in general, but they didn't seem to like me. This confused me. I, I had gotten into teaching by working in high-need schools, and 
and what had hooked me on the profession was the relationships I was able to develop across boundaries of class, race, and culture. I left my job in the Bronx to a round of applause from a group of black and Latino middle schoolers. In a Colorado high school with a 50% dropout rate, I had gotten a Native American boy named Andrew to read Hemingway and Keats with me when he refused to stay in class. Several of the English language learners I taught in the Czech Republic came to my wedding. Before Brookline, I thought of my ability to connect with students across boundaries as a strength. And here, where there were so many fewer boundaries to cross, connection was surprisingly difficult. I looked to my colleagues for guidance on how to be in the classroom, but I didn't know which persona fit me. When I tried to emulate the strictness of my mentor teacher, my department had noted that I came off as intimidating. You want students to feel supported, not judged, she said. So I tried emulating my department head. I, <laughs> I asked students what their weekend plans were at the start of class, as I had seen her do. While this had generated a lively conversation in her class, I got crickets. Not finding my model in English, I observed colleagues in other departments. One teacher told several long stories about his, his youth during a pretty unstructured lesson. A student who seemed indifferent in my class listened, rapt. I would have felt uncomfortable taking up so much space in the classroom, but maybe this was what students wanted? I had come to Brookline High thinking I knew these students, but I felt as though I had no idea who they were, what they wanted, and how I should be with them. Last year was my fourth year at Brookline High School, and I went in with the mentality of a high school senior. I had tried out different personas, and I was just going to be myself. I had professional status, so I didn't have to worry about what others thought of me. I, I rewrote my introductory letter to students for the fourth time. It had been based on a template from my mentor, and much of the voice was still hers. I deleted her polished, self-assured sentences. An email Ms. Hodling had sent our class was tacked up on my bulletin board. Her sentences were similarly witty, confident, wry, but that tone was all wrong for me. I filled the document with exclamation points and used caps for emphasis. I let go of trying to appear erudite and put together like Miss H, and instead started off the year with a goofy enthusiasm more characteristic of myself. And my juniors responded to it. This was the beautiful class I had imagined when I'd gotten the job. They asked genuine questions and joked with me. They stayed after class to pursue a point from discussion and shared funny stories when I asked about their weekends. The week before Christmas, a student started off a comment with, because we have such a nice community in this class. That felt like a real win. I had felt a sense of community, but by this point I had absolutely no faith in my read on the classroom. It was nice to have confirmation that the students felt it too. Towards the end of the year, as we finished Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon, we spent some time on the final line. For now, Milkman knew what Solomon knew. If you surrendered to the air, you could ride it. We brainstormed what it meant to surrender to the air. Get out of your comfort zone. Take risks. Let yourself be vulnerable. Own your identity. Then I asked students to free write about a time when they surrendered to the air or when they were unable to do so. To get them thinking, I offered an example from my own life. When I was a junior, I had a huge crush on this kid in my English class I began. Oh, they shouted. I told them about how I was a very good kid, but that this boy I had a crush on was kind of a pothead. One time he asked me to hang out with him and his friends after school, and I really wanted to go, but I was afraid of putting myself in this situation where they might smoke and I wouldn't know how to say no. I was afraid of what they would think of me, that they would judge me, so I told him that I couldn't go, that I had to do homework. In telling this story, I felt again my high school self's insecurity. It was a personal story, and I got a little nervous as I spoke, but I could see that it hit home. The students listened with genuine interest. I wasn't able to surrender to the air, I concluded, to step out of my comfort zone and own my identity. And then what happened? That's it, a student said? You lost your chance at true love. Is that why you came back to teach here? Come and feel We had a playful back and forth. Then I heard out their stories. They listened and responded to one another. We were still talking as class ended, and no one moved to pack up his things. I remembered Miss H throwing the chalk at the clock. It was not something I would do. That was not my personality. But somehow in surrendering to the air, in offering these students my authentic self, I fostered the same atmosphere I had so appreciated in her class. I did not gain students' admiration with the French philosophes or a Harvard diploma, but somehow in spite of, or perhaps because of, my vulnerability, they liked me anyway.
Thank you, Sophie. That's great. I was thinking about the word community that Sophie used, uh, and I was thinking about the BEF. And I just need to say again uh, how much teachers appreciate the community that the BEF allows us to build, um, the, their generosity, their opportunities, um, and then the specific support I've received from Liz uh, and Kathy uh, in years past. I, I, I just have to say it to Kathy, it's been a great honor for me. So thank you for that. Um, all right, also community. Um, I'm part of a program that works with beginning teachers in the district, and this is how I got to know Sherry. Uh, and I've watched her be a caring, concerning, uh, thoughtful mentor to others. Uh, and I'm excited to introduce her to you. Uh, Sherry Dalsheim, a second grade teacher from Pete. Okay, I'm not making eye contact, just so you know. Um, making magic. Decades of teaching and infusing the joy of learning into children continue to feed my soul. My husband sees this is emotional for me, but it won't be for you, so just ignore it. <laughs> My husband sees the delight I experience in teaching children, mentoring adults, basically assisting all learners in finding their own path, and of course the daily, pretty consistent planning and the stories, oh the stories from my classroom. Each interaction actually makes me tingle. My students are complicated puzzles, there are a few of them out there right now. Figuring out what makes each individual tick, how to get each personal clock in sync, and infused with my passion about life and learning is my daily mission. It's how I approach the art of teaching. 30 years of teaching and going strong, folks ask why I'm still in the classroom. I'm a perpetual learner, a mover, a shaker, a doer. I explored other leadership roles, have multiple certifications, yet I choose to be the daily choreographer of magic in my classroom. I'm lucky I get to teach every single day. Here's a glimpse into why I have the best job in the entire world. Close your eyes and imagine, if you're lucky, you'll see what I see. A crisp fall day during recess, roaring laughter fills the air. Children run with abandon, looking like a sea of smiles, waves of energy synthesized with leaves rustling in the breeze, branches swaying in the wind, moments cemented in time. One child stands on a boulder beside the play structure. She stands alone on that huge rock next to the swings filled with friends. Wild giggles ooze from children whose limbs tangle on tire swings, Annie smiles, hair blowing. With a twinkle in her eye, she whispers to the fluttering leaves. The special education team that worked with Annie was struggling, having difficulty understanding her. In the midst of this time, Annie was beginning to learn, and I to teach. One educator confessed that Annie was frustrating. Annie didn't comply, stating she lived in her own world. Maybe Annie wasn't cut out for public school. That educated didn't see whom I saw. She saw a child disconnected from reality, a little girl who doesn't follow rules. She saw a child who could not read nor solve math problems, deficits instead of richnesses. She saw a child who had nothing to offer, disconnected. She saw a child living in a parallel universe, not in reality. I saw a sweet little girl, a child beginning to thrive in a safe space, one with opportunities to explore her interests and communicate with others. She was like a homing pigeon, consistently returning to her positive environment and to me, filled with wonderings and giggles, beginning to apply skills and engage with her learning and her peers. When I asked Annie about her conversation with the leaves, she matter-of-factly stated, leaves can't talk. Her gentle perspective said, I talk to the leaves because nobody else does. I saw a child who was the definition of inclusiveness. Crafting ideas and reworking ways to teach, infusing passion into learning take over my mind, morning, noon, and night. 2 a.m., how will I craft friendships for these cherubs? New class, new design. I'll bring in a puppet theater for children. They'll take delight in this during literacy. Motivation seeps into each child's very being. 2.45 a.m., how can I create a learning environment that enables all my children to work together, apply the skills I've taught? Eureka, I'm a classically trained ballet dancer. Teaching is dancing, requiring rich choreography, creative, creativity and movement. I'm a curriculum developer and a dancer, still dancing, breathing joy into my body and into theirs. Hmm, using dance, I could teach perseverance and practice grit with my students, 
What better way to experience the satisfaction of working hard? The sheer joy of prancing through discovery became my undercurrent for learning design. Children presenting poetry regularly set the stage for increasing public speaking comfort and practice as a respectful audience member. Blooming petals turn orange and red. Weather changes and a new crop of students begin under my care. Class chemistry, solidifying at class community is always a must first step. Designing conscious opportunities for daily greetings and physically engaging activities. Actually teaching how to jete across the classroom or chenet turn while spotting requires concentration and smiles. Imagine those thinkers transforming into dancers, elongating their steps as their minds stretch, experiencing learning while engaging in movement. Haha, <laughs> that was it. A seemingly universal entry point. Fun combined with structure, anticipated in class flying. What a draw, balancing movement with skill development. My role of choreographer continued to develop. Incorporating the structure of dance to learning academic was key. Not for, not for performance sake, but for complete engagement. The investment was palpable, even visible. Definitely a draw for Annie and all her peers. Sometimes my brightly colored puppet theater was an alternative stage for sharing carefully crafted thinking opinions. Now to design a way to make that within a sequentially sensible and productive framework for Annie so she could be successful. You know, fair means everyone gets what they need. Annie, that innocent little girl, the girl that learned to trust, ask questions, stay on topic, share developing insights, happily engage in activities. She skipped out the door for recess with the other children on a crisp, cool day. Parallel play, looking different in second grade. Annie, finding her way, although not yet consistently included in group activities, she was beginning to learn to navigate unstructured times, times like recess. She needs time, time to develop and formulate her thoughts into words. Our eyes lock and she half smiles, raising her hands to her mouth. She has something to say, and when she's ready to share her discoveries or frustration, she knows I'll be here. Of course this is the right placement for Annie, isn't it? Why don't others talk with her, not at her? All the wonderment of discovery is evident in her actions, her very being. Although sweet, earnest, and responsive, many don't see that side of Annie. Our interactions help slow me down, solidify my understanding of the importance of educating the whole child. Building relationships, focusing on understanding each student, informal, ongoing, assessing, not filling out 12 forms in 20 minutes, looking at each individual in front of me. A teacher defines and demonstrates kindness, warmth, respect, modeling how to treat others. Everyone can get smarter. For me, teaching how to approach a problem with a new perspective is nurturing. Teaching children to use strategies to problem solve sets the foundation for success. Teaching involves smiling from within. Celebrating strengths, recognizing areas that can be further developed, then scaffolding a framework in which children can grow. Kindness can be taught, demonstrated when one child quoted me. She said, I know you could do it, to Annie. Let me break it down into smaller steps for you so you could have an entry point. <laughs> oh my, the sweetness of that little girl, the honesty, her sincere earnestness. I learned more from her than I realized was possible. She learned how to participate in the world of school. We were both teacher and learner building a community. We learned together. I, an educator with a vision, invested in the process, regardless of the current jargon of academia, engaged in the pendulum of education. She, a trusting soul. Symbiotic relationships. My students are the sunflowers with fringe of dancing petals of academics problem solving and wonderment, with roots entwined with love, persistence, sweetness, and empowerment. I help the roots settle, and the children bloom into themselves. Choreography by deliberate design. My class is a living poem with stretching minds and dancing bodies twirling into their own creation, creations made stronger and smarter in my classroom. I see the wonderment of innocence, true joy in the face of discovery. I see the look of recognition when concepts make sense, childlike delight, developing trust, vulnerability, the community built from love and a touch of power from the surrounding universe. I see the evidence of Annie learning, infusing book discussions into her stories as she stands tall and strong, with that tick where she clasps her hands together, covers her mouth while she emits a burst of giggles. I see that child on the rock, feeling the strength of the shining sun, hearing birds twittering through bent branches, I smile at the sea of children engaging in hula hoops, hoops we designed by figuring out how to measure their weight so that the hoops went faster and stayed up longer. Children and their imaginations, children creating songs to sing, 
cones to float upon, developing skits to practice what they learned in class with the backdrop of changing seasons. That moment of connection, lightning within us souls, that light blinding warms my whole being and fills my heart. My hope, my dream, with an unwritten deadline, isn't to leave the classroom, but instead to embrace the joys within it, to unravel the living puzzles residing in that learning lab, to discover the layers of personality, to decipher the chemistry of each class, discern how to create a space for children to be themselves, to take risks, to connect with reality productively, successfully, like the sleep years inside of a clock, each dependent on the other to build the community of the future. Magic. We have so much water up here, if any of you want water. We have bottles and bottles of water. And very exciting. Water, water everywhere. Um, Mar I, I was thinking of Margaret's stories. Uh, one of my favorite self-deprecating stories she told involved Conan O'Brien. Maybe some people have heard of this one. Um, Conan O'Brien was a Brookline student uh, and came back to visit at one point. Uh, to visit the high school and at some fundraising event or some big event to greet him, Margaret went up to him and said, Mr. Brian, I'm Margaret Metzger, I teach here at Brookline High. And he said, uh, Ms. Metzger, I was in your homeroom for four years. <laughs> I don't know if any of that's true, but I love that story. Um, because a lot of Margaret's uh, humor was in, involved self-deprecation. She knew how to, to not take herself too seriously, which is something I think we all try to do up here as well. Um, our next uh, person who's going to share is Shelly Mains from the Brookline Library, Brookline High School Library. Searching and finding at the high school library. Late last fall, during my Tuesday shifts at the Brookline High School Library circulation desk, I began to notice Marina, a sophomore. She signed into the library every week during her supposedly mandatory advisory block and stayed through the next period and lunch. I found Marina sweet and suspected something shifty might be going on. <laughs> Throughout the fall and winter, Marina never asked the librarians for anything other than a library pass. I don't think she really noticed that we are four different librarians. She referred to all of us, mostly bespectacled white ladies, by one of our names, and it wasn't mine. <laughs> I wasn't sure what this student needed from the library during those long weekly visits and whether she found it. She became a poster child for my ongoing question of how our library can best welcome and serve students whose needs may stretch beyond the academic while still providing top-notch support for learning and teaching at BHS. Some students come to the library with demands that are specific, if not always easy to meet. In a 40-minute block at the circulation desk, I might encounter a junior in search of an online copy of the Massachusetts Driver's Manual, which I sincerely hope they won't consult on their phone while driving, a freshman looking for an eraser and a, su a suggestion for a good read about serial killers, one of our library volunteers hoping to, to discuss how to launch an after-school book club for students who like to read but don't want to be told what to think about what they read, a senior who apparently won't graduate unless we immediately locate the official final shooting script for the film Pulp Fiction, and a sophomore attempting to track down a copy of the 1809 Swedish Constitution, especially the portions dealing with freedom of the press in English translation. <laughs> when I actually find it, there's no time for a fist pump because that freshman from before is back looking for his missing retainer. <laughs> luckily, luckily, I'm really good at finding things if I know what I'm looking for. But many students are searching for something elusive in the BHS library. While annual surveys give us important but superficial data on reasons student use, students use the library, printing, getting help finding a good book, doing research, working with friends, they don't give us the deeper story of which students in a given block might be using the library as a refuge from social pressures, a retreat from academic expectations, an eye in the hurricane known as high school. I think back to my own experiences in school libraries, what I needed, what I found. Like Marina, I don't remember paying much attention to my elementary or high school librarians, but their libraries were sure important to me. 
In third grade, I was allowed to take out Green Eyes, a picture book way below my reading level, week after week. I don't know what I was working through by reading and rereading the colorfully illustrated transformation of a kitten to a cat on a bucolic farm, but the bibliotherapy apparently worked. I would call my high school library less for research help or an introduction to great literature, and more for the sublimation I found reading cookbooks when I was on some crazy diet or another, and for the big tables downstairs where I could chat, very quietly of course, with friends. I do remember my junior high librarian because she was a witch. Not a euphemistic witch, but a practicing witch. She taught an extracurricular class on witchcraft, and it still baffles me that this got past the school board in suburban Minnesota. <laughs> FYI, the love essay she ta taught me to make was woefully ineffective. I also remember that the junior high library offered books in many genres that were new to me. I was able to survive the awkwardness of early adolescence through reading fiction of all kinds. In the process, I learned about history, imagined different worlds, found role models, and developed compassion for di people different than myself. One of my library professors was fond of saying that a wonderful thing about being a librarian is bringing our whole lives to the job. I can connect the dots from the empathy nurtured by reading in childhood and beyond to the nuggets of wisdom gained from my varied life experiences to now supporting students, like when my colleagues and I grew concerned about all the time Marina spent in the library. We talked to her dean, and happily, this didn't alienate Marina. She continued visiting the library regularly, though with a little more oversight and accountability. She started asking for help here and there, and she still couldn't really tell the librarians apart. <laughs> As I helped Marina find books for research and pleasure reading, I learned bits and pieces about her family's harrowing history and losses during conflicts in their country, which led to their immigration. I appreciated how much Marina valued her culture and wanted to learn about the history that had deeply affected those she loved. I mentioned to Marina's English teacher that I enjoyed connecting with this student in her library visits. It seemed to me that she was a bright, resilient teen, though perhaps a reluctant student. Her teacher noted that Marina chafed against the strict limits set by her concerned traditional parents and was becoming increasingly disobedient at home and school. It occurred to me that she could do worse than play cookie in the library. The last time I saw Marina during the year, she made an appointment with me to study for an English test on Shakespeare. One of her teachers stopped by to ensure that we were working together. When she saw Marina and I huddled at a carol, she gave Marina a supportive squeeze and told her she was happy she'd made it to the library. I think we all were. Despite what I've heard students mutter, mutter under their breath, no witches work at the BHS library. <laughs> we can cast no spells to make the library a charmed respite where students find what they need, academic, social, emotional, and more, when they walk through the door. I don't have a wand to wave over the loud kids and the mousy kids, the bros and the geeks, the driven learners and the driven socializers to harmonize their varied identities, styles, and needs. I can produce band-aids, glue sticks, whiteout, cardboard boxes to create Roman chariots, of course, many varieties of tape, and safety pins for clothing malfunctions. But I can't whip up love sachets and scatter them around the library to ensure that all the kids crowded into our limited space treat one another kindly and no one gets hurt. Instead, I manufacture my own mojo from components like professional expertise, teamwork with my librarian work wives, support from colleagues outside the library, constant vigilance, and more shushing than I wish were ever called for. <laughs> Creating a welcoming library takes collective sweat and the occasional big wet tear. But then Marina pushes through the doors and says, Ms. Maines, will you help me? Maybe there is indeed magic in circulation at the library. Margaret believed in telling the truth, uh, and sometimes that got her in trouble, um, but she'd still speak her mind, she'd still say what she believed. Students and colleagues respond to that, uh, sometimes they were surprised by it, sometimes she surprised herself. Our next truth teller uh, 
is Kathy Fisher Mueller, uh, who I had the pleasure of sharing a stage with a few years ago uh, at the Caverly, so it's great to share this with you today. Uh, Kathy teaches at Fluid Corner School. She's a middle school social studies teacher, and I am honored to invite her to the mic. Thank you, and I do want to thank John for being an incredible teacher for all of us. This is called The Stories We Tell. In 1986, when I was in 10th grade in Milford, New Hampshire, I read To Kill a Mockingbird and loved it. For many years, I would say it was my favorite book. I wanted to name my dog Atticus. My dad reminded me of Gregory Peck. I would often quote the line after the verdict is read, they've done it before, and they did it tonight, and they'll do it again. And when they do, it seems that only children meet. So two years ago, when my daughter Maya started to read To Kill a Mockingbird in ninth grade, I told her how much I loved it. Now, to say my daughter Maya doesn't like to read is an understatement, but I was excited for her to read the book that had so impacted me at her age. After finishing the novel, Maya commented, yeah, I can see why white people like that book so much. <laughs> it is reasonable to say that something at play here is a teenager's desire to annoy her mother. But in one comment, Maya, a young woman of color, summed up so much about my experience as a white person. I want to see myself as Atticus. I want to think that I would be on the side of justice that I would not allow the Ewells to unfairly charge Tom Robinson. Many well-meaning white people are so quick to say, and mean it, that we are willing to fight the institutionalized racism we see around us, without perhaps thinking about how these very systems have benefited us. I was recently reminded how my own family is an example of this. Not long ago, I went to legal seafood with my sister, my brother-in-law, and my father. As my sister and I both had college-aged children, we were talking about the high cost of tuition. The conversation turned to affirmative action. My brother-in-law was commenting on the admittance policies of some universities that seemed to favor students of color. Clearly, my brother-in-law was questioning the fairness of such policies. My 80-year-old father, who was the chief of labor relations in the FAA and later investigated cases of discrimination within government agencies, responded, I think it's probably a fair observation, but I wonder what benefits we received because we are white that put our children in the position they are in now. As I sat in the leather booth at Legal Seafood, I reflected on the fact that my father's whiteness opened up a pathway to the acquisition of wealth that I had never fully noted. The story how my family had worked its way up that I had always told with pride became more complicated. My grandfather was a bus driver. He and my grandmother raised three sons in a triple-decker apartment in Englewood, New Jersey. In 1953, the Korean War was underway and my father and his brothers enlisted in the military. Fortunately for my dad, the war ended while he was still training in Hawaii. Nonetheless, he and his brothers qualified for the GI Bill. The GI Bill, or the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, provided veterans with college tuition, low-cost mortgages, and loans for businesses. This benefit dramatically changed the standard of living for a generation of veterans and their families, including mine. However, the GI Bill gave money to many banks that in turn would not give African Americans the mortgages and business loans that were secured by white veterans. Ira Katznelson, professor of political science at Columbia University, argues that the law was deliberately designed to accommodate Jim Crow. He cites one 1940 study that concluded it was as though the GI Bill had been earmarked for white veterans only. Bill Clinton once said that the GI Bill was proof that if you give the American people, ordinary Americans, a chance to help themselves, they will do extraordinary things. I believe this is true. But what is also true is that my father's family was aided in ways that families of color, who were every bit as willing to help themselves and do extraordinary things, were denied. Recently, 
I've been reconsidering what these stories mean, both my family's economic rise and To Kill a Mockingbird. For a long time, I used my family as the classic example of the American dream. My grandfather worked to find his way into the middle class, and in only two generations, all of his grandchildren graduated from college. This is true and something to be proud of. An Atticus is noble and someone to be admired. It is also true that whiteness and the privilege it brings plays a huge role in both stories, and that needs to be discussed as well. In some ways, the Brookline schools remind me of Atticus, or an attempt to be Atticus. White educators want to do noble things. The school systems keep making one program after another other to address issues of access and equity. And these are thoughtful initiatives led by smart and committed people. But I worry that we are doing it with the underlying ethos of helping the poor brown and black kids, and not in order to create a more just and democratic society. What would it mean to all members of our community if inequalities were named and people were willing to make substantive structural changes to the institutions that continue to benefit white members of our society more than non-white? In her New York Times essay on To Kill a Mockingbird, excuse me, Roxane Gay writes, As for the story, I can take it or leave it. Perhaps I am ambivalent because I am black. I am not the target audience. I don't need to read about a young white girl understanding the perniciousness of racism to actually understand the perniciousness of racism. I have ample firsthand experience. I shared this quote with my daughter, Maya. Exactly, she said. I mean, they don't need to use a southern 12-year-old from the 1930s to teach me about racism. Scout's story is not Roxane Gay's story, and it is not Maya's either. And for the record, this is not an essay arguing against teaching To Kill a Mockingbird. I still think the line, they'll do it again, and when they do it seems that only children weep, is beautiful and relevant. Instead, this is an invitation for well-intentioned white educators to revisit the stories we hold dear. It might be worth questioning if we are drawn to stories that label the good guys and the bad guys and offer a more simplistic construct of race, as opposed to those that offer a harsher truth that all white people in the United States have benefited from the institutions that were set up to benefit us from the start. And so I think white educators have to look honestly at our stories, the stories we hold in our families, the stories we use to frame our national identity, and most importantly, the stories we teach our students. What narrative, whose narrative, do they tell? What assumptions do they allow us to keep, and what don't they demand that we change? Thank you. hard to talk about ways to bring students full selves into the classroom and one of the themes that came up in our writing this summer I think was how do we bring ourselves into the classroom how do teachers bring our true selves into the classroom 24 years ago I was uh, a graduate student in one of Margaret's uh, methods courses she taught a, a methods course for English teachers and I was just thunderstruck by her I couldn't take it all in and at the end of the the class, as she often did with her classes at the high school, she said, okay, I'll give you one day when you can ask me anything. <laughs> so I looked timidly, how do you do this? <laughs> like, how are you you? How are you so funny and honest and fun? And just like gushed. And she just looked at me and said, years of work. <laughs> um, and she did the work. Uh, she brought herself into the classroom, and that was part of the magic of what made her the effective teacher that she was. Our next reader is Melissa London, uh, who is a middle school science teacher at Pierce. Uh, 
Uh, is this okay? You can hear me? Yeah. Okay, so uh, my story is called Sometimes It's Not Time for Math. Um, <laughs> what's wrong, Jason? Jason stands in front of me, fist clenched, face hot and red, and his eyes scrunched behind his two large glasses, not saying anything. Jason, I see you're upset. I, I want you to open your eyes. Take a deep breath and tell me what's happened. And then words wet with tears and spittle spill out. Michael called me a lezzy. Oh boy. He called you a lezzy? He nods. And Billy too, they chased me around the field screaming, Jason's a lezzy. I'm very sorry that happened, Jason. And it's certainly not okay. But I want to ask you something. Do you know what that word lezzy means? A few seconds pass before he answers. No, but I know it's a bad thing. It's 1997, my first year teaching, and it sure is. In as confident a teacher tone as I can muster, I tell him, Leslie refers to the term lesbian, which means a woman who loves another woman. Jason looks confused, and I worry his tears might start again, so I, I quickly add, so think about this for just a second. Since you aren't a woman, you can't possibly be a lesbian, can you? Relief spreads across Jason's face. <laughs> now, disaster narrowly averted. Now, other children stream into the classroom from recess. A group of giggly girls saunters in first, Michael and Billy right behind them. Soon everyone is in their seats. I wish I had more time with Jason to process the moment, the word, the larger, more significant concept of who one loves, but I don't. I send him to the boys' room to wash his face, but not before getting his permission to speak to Michael and Billy. I direct the class to take out a silent reading book and then tap the boys, gesturing for them to meet me at the back of the room. And I ask them what happened with Jason at recess, and they tell me that during keep away, Jason got upset when he couldn't get the ball back and he punched Michael in the arm. I'm sorry that happened, are you okay? I ask Michael, and he nods. I wait a moment to see if they will say anything more, and they don't. With a room full of children wondering why they weren't having math class and Jason returning any second, I don't have time to surface an admission. Okay, boys, just so you know, I understand there may be more to this story. And Michael and Billy look down at their shoes. For now, you're not in trouble, and neither is Jason. But this is a serious matter, and we'll need to discuss it further. In fact, I said, I think it might be important enough to talk about as a whole class. The boys look like they want to throw up. <laughs> I send them back to their seats. Students look up from their books, anticipating an announcement about the start of math. Well, talking about fractions would definitely be easier, but I know in my heart math class is not happening. I take a deep breath. Children, put your books away. This afternoon, instead of math, we're going to have a class discussion about something that impacts all of us as members of this classroom community. Curious faces peer back in my direction. As I turn to the whiteboard and write, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. I'm wondering, I say to the class, how many of you are familiar with this saying? Every one of the fourth graders raises a hand. Here's my next question. How many of you believe it's actually true? I am both surprised and pleased to see how many hands go down. OK, so I see lots of you feel this statement isn't true. Can I get a few willing folks to share their thoughts about why not? Half a dozen or so students volunteer stories of broken bones that took an eternity to heal, or stories about teasing that had crossed the line, causing hurt feelings. I'm pretty proud of myself because it seems like the discussion is going well. And even though neither Jason, Michael, or Billy have their voices, I think I see them sit up just a little straighter in their chairs as other students talk, and it's my hope that the three get what they need. I revel in the impact of this teachable moment when suddenly a memory from nearly 20 years ago reveals itself to me. And before I have a chance to think it through, I launch. Class, I have a story to share too. Uh, when I was just about your age, maybe a little older, I had a friend named Russell Conley. And I look around the room, not certain where this is going to lead, but students' faces assure me they are along for the ride, and no one's worried about math. <laughs> Russell and I were sitting together on the bus ride home one day, and he turned to me and he said, I don't want to be your friend anymore. When I asked him why, he told me, because you... I stopped mid-sentence, my breath catching. I start again, because you... 
I stop again. My face suddenly hot, my mouth suddenly very dry. And I look around and my students' faces wrapped, eager for me to continue. And there's no going back now, I realize. No option but to, to deliver the punchline, even as the first tears trickle down my cheeks. I swallow hard and I push the words out because you are a dirty Jew. I'm sorry, I say to my students, brushing away the tears. I'm mortified to still feel the sting of those words after so many years. And I worry I've said too much, gone too far. How will my students and I recover from this moment that has taken us all by surprise, perhaps me most of all? This wasn't in the lesson plan. I registered the student's silence and they were riveted. I imagine this is the first time they've seen their teacher cry. I walk to my desk for a few necks and blow my nose. When I turn back to the class, Jason's hand is raised. Yes, Jason? Ms. London, maybe that kid Russell wasn't really your friend after all. <laughs> Jason's insight is simple, profound, and perfect. In that instant, he is 27 and I am 10. And just as quickly, time writes itself. The students wait for me to say something. Well, Jason, I, I see now that Russell was definitely not my friend that day on the bus, and sadly, we never spoke again. I wonder if he has ever thought about what happened, the words he said to me. I'd like to think he regrets the hurt he caused me. And I glance in the direction of Michael and Billy. They look away from me. I'd like to think it's never too late to fix what we have broken. Now, many experiences inform a teacher's practice along the way. And what happened to me on that bus ride nearly 40 years ago at this point remains a vivid and visceral memory. But thankfully, so does this more helpful and hopeful memory from my first year teaching. I have shared the story of Russell many times since then, and it still has the power to make me cry. I have also ditched lesson plans when it was clear that dealing with our collective humanity was much more important. Those of you may be wondering about those final moments of that impromptu not math class in 1997. Children, it's almost time for art. But before you go, I need to ask you to do something. Please, please try to be good to one another. It's not always easy or even possible. But if we do our best to be careful with our words and to try to make it right if we ever cause hurt, well, that will be a very good start indeed. Now, pack up your things. I'll see you tomorrow. And one last thing, don't forget to do your math homework. <laughs> My students smile as they grab their backpacks and exit the room. Michael and Billy linger at the door, waiting for Jason. Methods class I took 24 years ago, Margaret talked about the triangle of teaching, that there is content and that there are students and there is a teacher, all these points on a triangle. And the last day she reminded us that at the center of the triangle is love. So thank you to our six readers. Thank you all of you for coming. I think we have more than 100 people for the first time at one of these events, which I'm very excited about. Appreciate your support of teachers. And then to make 
I'm going to put the screw in even more. Um, I have two board members um, who are, uh, I, do we, we have a bunch of board members here. Does everybody on the BEF board just want to stand up for a second so we can say hi and, and thank you for Board members um, are actually, uh, we're lucky enough to be um, Margaret's students at Brookline High School. So I'm going to um, give them a second to just uh, tell you a quick memory. Hi, my name is Amy Deutsch. This is Abby Cox. You know we're both on the BF board and both have the honor of having Margaret as our teacher at Brookline High School. So I just want to share a quick story with you. In my senior year in European literature, our capstone project was to read three books by one author and write a 20-page paper. I read book after book and couldn't find the author that resonated for me. On a Saturday morning in January, my home phone rang. It was Ms. Metzger calling me at home on a Saturday morning because she just had an idea and she had to tell me right that minute. She had found a special project just for me that challenged me as a learner and would help me grow as a, teacher, as a reader. And that's who she was, a teacher who worked exact, how to find the exact right things for each student. Her deep caring and desire to help her students grow was palpable. And when I read Amy's words last night, it inspired me to go to my bookshelf because this was the book that she pressed on me my senior year. And this is my original copy with my markup for my senior paper. Um, the mark that that Margaret Metzger. <laughs> oh, the so brothers Matsov. <laughs> um, the mark that Margaret Metzger left on me and so many of her students was indelible. Um, though I had supported the BEF for many years um, prior, it was the creation of the Mark Metzger Fellows Program that inspired me to join the board. And um, I'm not asking everyone here to join the board, though I encourage it. Uh, but if you found yourself moved by tonight's program and would like to see this kind of work continue, um, I hope you'll consider a contribution to the Metzger program at the BEF. Uh, thank you. And with that, um, please join us um, for some more um, nibbles and, and conversation. Um, and thank you so much for coming tonight. Really appreciate it.